Okay, today we're going to speak about a, a Mida, a very important Mida called Vatranus. The Mida of Vatranus is the Mida to be able to yield to another person or yield to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. So, on my way to this fantastic speech here today, I came upon a yield sign. And I'm sitting there in my car and I'm waiting. One car, two cars, three cars, four cars, five cars. And I'm sitting there quietly, relaxed waiting till finally the last car went by. I looked both ways, which we'll talk about, about looking both ways. And then I drove on. So how come it's so hard in real life to be able to yield to another person? How come you could sit at a yield sign for 10 minutes, wait till all the cars go by, but when it comes to another human being in your life, it's so hard to yield to them? And the answer is that we ourselves get in the way. We have a problem seeing the other person, seeing the other car, because we are seeing ourselves in that situation. We are, we are, blocking, we are blocking our visibility to the other person. We're in the way. When you're sitting in a car, there's nothing in your way. So you see all the other cars that are going by, so you're able to wait. But imagine if there was nothing on, if your, frit, your windshield was all iced up and you could not see, and you don't see the other cars. So then you would just go through the yield sign. <laughs> Bang. Accident. And that's what happens in our lives. When we don't yield because there is something blocking our vision of seeing the other person. <laughs> Bang. What comes from this? Period. Separation. Lashon Hara, Sinas Chinam, and maybe one of the worst Midos, and one of the Midos that this generation is struggling with so much, we become a Kafwe Tov. We don't appreciate what the other people, what Hashem, what everyone does for us, because to appreciate someone else, you have to get past yourself. Because if I'm in the way, so what do you mean I have to have a korsatov? I, 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 have this, I have this coming to me. Everything is coming to me. But if I remove myself, then there's nothing coming to me. And I'm able to see the other person. So this is not just a little teeny problem. But Tronus is the cause of many other problems in our relationships with others. So today, we're going to try to give you some answers, some solutions on how to be able to see the other person and how to be able to yield to another. So I want to start off with a story about a very big tzaddik. And this tzaddik, Davin to Hashem, he fasted, he davin, tachnunim and tehillim, he davin, that Hashem should tell him in a dream, he should have a dream to know where he's going to sit in Gan Eden, who is Chavrusa, who's going to be my Chavrusa in Gan Eden. It's very important who you're going to sit with in Gan Eden. So he davins and he davins and he fasts, and a malach comes to him in his dream and he says, so and so, the simpleton, the simple person, the simple peasant who lives in this village, he is going to be your Chavrusa. He gets up in the morning, this can't be. This can't be, all my learning, all my Torah. So, he decides, let me go see who this, let me see this, let me meet this guy. He's going to be my Chavrusa, let me see who he is. So he goes to this village, and he looks up this peasant, and this peasant's in a store, he's working, and he says to him, is, is this your name? Yes. He says, tell me, what do you do like in your life that's like unbelievable, you know, that you should be sitting in Ghanaian in a very high place? Simpleton's a simple person, I don't know. I have a business, and, I, and, I, and I'm honest, my weights are, are honest, and I, and I give the poor people better prices than the rich people, and I, and because I know they need it, and, and I give tzedakah, and this tzaddik's listening, he goes, and, 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 what else, what, what do you do, what do you do? I don't know if they'll be my chavusa, like, what, what, do you, what else, what else? And he's like, ah, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know, oh, I remember something that happened a long time ago. Oh, no, what was it, what was it? Well, there was, 
there was this uh, a band of, of bandits and, and, and kidnappers, and they were coming through the town, and there was a little, there was a young girl that was sitting there and crying, and I walked over to her and I said, why are you crying? And she said, I'm Jewish, and I was kidnapped from a town, and now they're going to sell me, and I'm scared they're going to sell me to non-Jewish people. Could you help me? He said, so I went ahead. I didn't have that much money. I'm a simpleton, peasant, and I went, and I, I paid. I paid for her to, 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 to get her out of this, of this band of bandits. Okay? And then what did you do? He said, well, I took her home. And? And I brought her up as one of my own. And what else did you do? Well, it came time for her to get married. Shidduch. And I decided that I'm going to give my son to her to be the chassan in a marriage. And I went to my son. And being that she had no family because she was a hostage, um, I said to my son, listen, uh, do me a favor. I'm asking you a favor. Would you mind being her chassan? You know, I know that there's no family, there's no dowry, there's no money, but it would be a big thing for her. And the chassan, the boy said, Tati, Daddy, Abba, whatever you want, I'll marry her. So he went ahead, he gathered all his money because he wanted her to feel really good, and he prepared this amazing wedding, amazing wedding. And he started going around, it was before the chuppah, and he saw everybody was sitting at their tables, they were eating, and they were happy, and he came to this one table, and everybody, nobody was eating. He said to the men at the table, why aren't you eating? And he said, you see that boy sitting at the end of the table? That boy, he doesn't stop crying. We lost our appetite. We're sitting here, the kid's crying and crying and crying. We lost our appetite. So the peasant goes over to the young boy, and he says, is there something, I mean, is the food not good enough? No, the food's good. Do you, do you need money? Do you need clothing? Whatever you need, I'll give you. I want you to be happy at my wedding. I, I can't be happy. I can't be happy at your wedding. Why can't you be happy? He said, because the kala, the girl that your son's about to marry, she, when I was younger, her parents made a deal with my parents, and really, she's supposed to be my wife. He said, you sure it's that girl? He says, yes, I come from the town where she was kidnapped, and I have a letter that my parents and their parents made an agreement. He took out the letter. He looks at the letter. He says, Ay, vay, what am I going to do now? We have a whole chasana. My son's about to walk down the chuppah. He's sitting in the chasana's room. And I have a paper here of this young boy who's crying that really he was supposed to marry her. So he goes to his son. And he says, you know, I asked you a while ago if you would do for me, and you did. You said you're going to marry her for me. Well, now I have to ask you a bigger favor. There's a boy, and he's sitting there, and he's crying, and he showed me this paper. At the end of the day, they're supposed to be married to each other. I need you to let him walk to the chuppah and marry her instead of me, instead of you. The boy looks at his father. He says, if that's what you want, no problem. And that night, this man walked that boy and that girl to the chuppah. The whole wedding, the music, and everything he gave to that young boy that was crying at his wedding. And not only that, he went ahead and he made Sheva brachas for them. He let them live by his house for a year. He made them furniture. The stories brought down in the Ma'am in Parshas by Midbar. Amazing. Amazing. He could have come up with every excuse. Listen, <laughs> I'm really sorry, you know. You got to go find yourself with your own kala. I mean, you know, I just spent all this money on the wedding. I'm really sorry that you have such a letter. Listen. It will be very hard for us, but it's very interesting because Yad Eliezer in Eretz Yisrael who does amazing work, so anyone who had kids that got married knows that you can call up Yad Eliezer and they'll tell you the night that you're making the wedding for your child, there's a wedding of a Yusayma in Eretz Yisrael. Would you make a wedding for Yusayma when you're not sure it's a schooler that your kids are going to have a good marriage? Nobody has a problem writing that check. So, Manishtana, so what's the difference if I'm paying for your shame and Eretz Yisro? Or if there's a guy at my wedding who's saying, give me your wedding. That's my kala. Why is that so hard? And writing a check to Yad Eliezer, right, is easier. And the answer is that I am not invested. I am giving a check. But it has nothing to do with me being in the way. At my wedding of my child, What's in the way of me giving it over to someone else? Me, myself. Matronis is the ability to remove yourself 
from the situation. So I would like to give, not just to talk about the problem, but I would like to give three ideas, three different ideas on how to own this Mida of Vatranas. So the first idea, you have to go into what we call third person. What does that mean, third person? That means that instead of looking at the situation, that I, I'm in this situation, I take myself out of the situation, and I go to a third person. A story that happened, I have a Talmud that his wife sent him to the store to get two cans of string beans. She was making some kind of string bean salad. He comes home with two cans of asparagus. She is so upset. She is so upset. That they gave me a sh- I got a Shalom bias call. Rabbi Wallerstein, I don't understand. We just got married. Like, how could he make such a mistake? Like, if his friend sent him, he wouldn't make such a mistake. Was he on a cell phone? Doesn't he care about me? Oh, she was so upset. So, many of the people watching are like, she should be upset. She sent him for string beans, and he came home with this barragus. But now let's remove ourselves. Let, let her remove herself from the story. Now, her friend, the third person, calls her up. You know what happened today? My husband, I sent him to get string beans, and he came home with asparagus. How would you react, I asked her. She said, I would think it's very funny. <laughs> she said, the guy, he, yeah, he sent him for string beans, he comes over with asparagus. But let's say your friend would say, yeah, but that means he doesn't love me. No, you would say, he loves you and he cares about you. He wasn't thinking, he made a mistake by accident. Happens to be that in this story, the, the real answer was that this boy was told by his mother when he used to shop not to take the cans in front, because those are the dated cans. The new cans are in the back. So this kid wanted to do good. He wanted to be special. So he put his hand in the back of the string beans. He didn't look at it, and he brought it home. And the guy who put the, the stockman, whoever set up the stock, put it. So it wasn't even his fault. So when you go to the third person, and you're like, that person is asking me what I would do in that situation, it's a very different answer totally in any situation. Also, what I learned from this is that you have to wait. You cannot react because had she let him answer, he would have told her that my mother, I'm sorry, but she told me to take from the front. And if you go, if you go to the store, you'll see that there's, a, there's asparagus behind the string beans. And it's really not my fault. So I think that Batronus, by going to a Going, making yourself the third person, whether you're a Rebbe and, a, and, and you, know, you have a kid in class that, that, you're not, that, 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 you're, that you're upset about, but if, you add, if another Rebbe would call you in the same situation, you'd say, have more you know, patience and show more love. So if you want to react correctly, then what you need to do is you need to take yourself out of the situation and go to a third person. And sometimes even ask a third person. If you have a Rav or someone to ask, Ask a third person, what would you do in this situation? And if you waited and you're not that angry anymore, you'll, you'll get the right answer. So I think that's a fantastic solution when it comes to, when it comes to Vatronis, and that is take yourself out of the equation and make believe someone else is asking you about that situation that you're in. Another, another solution which I think um, is, is uh, extremely, extremely important is... Hakar Satov. We all, if we know anything about Hakar Satov, we all have recognition that someone has done us good. When, when I'm focusing on what the other person did for me, I dissolve. I disappear in this equation. Because, wow, this person, instead of being impatient, instead of not yielding to this person, I'm like, with this person, my mother, my father, whatever that person is, my wife, my child, whoever it is, this person has done for me in my life, that hakar satov, that recognition of that person, what they've done for me, when I recognize you, what you did for me, I disappear. Because I'm recognizing you. So I think that one of the main points when it comes to Vatranas is to work on your hakar satov. Because if you have a car set type, again, there has to be a delay. I think the most important thing here, the point here is that there has to, to, to go into a third person or to have a car set type is not to react immediately. A half an hour, an hour later, when you're thinking about what I owe this person, I can't, I have to yield, I have to, I have to see this other person. I have to remove myself. 
Do you know what this person did for me? You know what Hashem did for me? Right? So I have to remove myself. When, when you, you give yourself time and you step back and you think about, well, if somebody would ask me this question, this is how I would answer. So I think it's very important not to react immediately. Amazing story that I just heard. So this Rebbe walks into class and he's late. And he walks in, sits down at his desk, and a kid in the middle of the class, Rebbe! Starts pointing to his watch. Chutzpah! Chutzpah, the Rebbe said. A kid is pointing to his watch because I came late. Oh, he's on fire. This Rebbe had a fantastic rule. His rule was he never reacts. No matter what happens in school, no matter what happens, he does not react for a half an hour. This was a rule that he had. This was a meet. I don't react for half an hour. We'll see what happens. Okay? He's sitting there. He's steaming. What's with this kid? Half an hour, the bell rings, it's recess. Oh, this kid's going to get it now. Oh, I'm a chutzpah. Points to his watch. And the kid runs up to the desk. Rebbe, Rebbe, look, I wanted, I wanted you to see it when the minute you walked in. Look, look what I got for my birthday. My parents just bought me a new watch. And the Rebbe's like, that's a really nice watch. Oh, wow. And the kid walks out and goes to recess, and the Rebbe's like, Oy vey, had I reacted. Had I screamed mechutzif to this kid. Had I thrown him out of class. He just was so excited. He loves me so much. He just wanted to show me his watch. You have to wait. You have to wait. Because if you wait, the reaction will be 100% different. Yielding. The word yielding means to wait. When you stand at a yield sign, it means not to stop. It's not a stop sign. It's a yield sign. Let the other person go. You go second. That's Vatranus. I would like to tell you a story about a little boy. We call it the story of the mumbling boy. So there's this this little boy who was in yeshiva, about a fifth, sixth grader, I think it was a sixth grader, and when he used to go to, to, to gym to play, the Rebbe would see that many times he was mumbling to himself. And then sometimes in class, when other kids would talk to him, he would be mumbling to himself. So he became very nervous about this. So he called the parents and he said, you know, I'm realizing that your son mumbles a lot. He, he talks to, he's very young to be talking to himself. He talks to himself a lot. So I think you need to get this checked out. And his mother said, you know what? At home, I catch him doing this very often. He's talking to himself. He's mumbling. I think we need to take him to a therapist. So they take this little, we'll call him Chaim, take little Chaim to the therapist, and he sits down, little guy, and the therapist says, listen, um, Chaim, so um, I hear that you're talking to yourself a little bit in school. You're talking to yourself a little bit at home. Maybe you want to let me in on what you're saying. Like, what are you talking? Are you telling yourself stories? Are you calling people names? Like, maybe let me in on what you're saying. And Chaim's like, no, no, I don't really want to talk about it. It's not really fair. It's my secret. I don't really want to. I know it's your secret, but we have to find out the source of this because it's not good to be walking around talking to yourself. Okay, okay, okay. I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why I talk to myself. So she sits down, and this is what he says, this little Chaim. He says, well, my Rebbe told us a story in class that there was this lady and this man that were married for a very long time, and they had no children, 13, 14 years. And they came to the Gal Hador of Chaim Kainevsky, and they said, could you give us a haftacha, a promise, that we're going to have children? And Rav Chaim said, I can't do that. I can't give you a haftacha. But if you find a person that was embarrassed in public and didn't answer, if they give you a bracha, it's going to be Mekayim. It's going to happen. A year later, this lady, who didn't have children for a long time, was at a wedding in Israel. And the wedding was a divorce. The Kala's parents were divorced. 
And she was at this wedding. She was invited. And the mother, right, who was now the ex-daughter-in-law of the grandmother of the Kala, who was not invited, it was a very nasty divorce, she was not invited, she decided, the mother, that she's going to come to the wedding anyway, just to get one dance with her daughter. And the mother walks in, and the mother-in-law starts screaming, you ruined my son's life, my grandchildren's life, get out of here, you can't dance with the Kala, in front of everyone the most embarrassing moment that you, that you can't even imagine such an embarrassing moment. And the mother of the Kala, she couldn't get into the circle, pretty much turned around and walked out, of, ran out of the wedding hall, so embarrassed in front of everyone. And this lady was there, and she, she was like, everybody was standing there, was like, oh my gosh, we never saw anything like this. And also she goes, oh, oh my gosh, she got embarrassed in front of the whole, the whole wedding. She didn't answer. She runs out of the wedding hall. This lady was already halfway down the street. Wait, wait! She's thinking it's probably her other side running after her, who knows what. She starts running, they're running. Finally, she catches up to her. She goes, no, 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 no. Stop, stop. Give me a bracha, give me a bracha. She goes, give me a bracha? I just got thrown out of my, my child's wedding. How can I give you a bracha? No, but you were embarrassed, and you didn't say one word to your mother-in-law. You didn't say one word to anyone. You just walked out. Please, please, I don't have children 13, 14 years. Give me a bracha. What's your name? Whatever her name is. What's your husband's name? Okay, I'll give you a bracha. Not that I think it's anything. Next year, this time, she make a bris. Kachaya. The Rebbe told his class, the next year at that time, they made a bris. I believe that Rav Chaim, if I read the story correctly, Rav Chaim was a sandik. Okay, says the therapist, great story. Why are you mumbling? Well, you see, every day before we dive in, my Rebbe puts 10 names of sick people on the board. And we dive in for those, sick pe those, six, those 10 sick, sick people. And I memorized all their names. And when I go home, sometimes my brothers and sisters, they make fun of me. So whenever they make fun of me, you know what I do? I say those 10 names quietly. Like we should have a Rafur Shalema. Because Rav Chaim said that someone who's embarrassed in public and doesn't answer, has unbelievable power to make a nace. And I want to make a nace for these 10 people. What? That's what he was mumbling? So when nothing else works, look at this little boy. Look at the power of a little boy. Imagine our power. When nothing else works, a person has to be mavir amidoiso. A person has to go against the natural amida is to answer back. But if you break your natural amida, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu breaks teva. Every single person has the power to do miracles, just like that woman. Every person has that power by, by what? By breaking their nature. So if we're able, this Tisha B'Av, to walk out of this and break the eye, all of a sudden we're going to see so much of the you. May we all be zeiche to see the ultimate you, which is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with the building of the third base of Mingdash.